And hello, everybody. Absolute uh, pleasure to be speaking with you all today. Um, so a little bit about myself. I've been working at Twitter for coming up five years, um, but in the Global Content Partnership team. Uh, but it's not just me. There's three of us. So I also work alongside Oliver Wilton and Ian Wheeler. And basically, between the three of us, we're working across entertainment partners, uh, sports bodies, uh, news partners, journalists, um, and TV broadcasters. And how the three of us can help all of you on the call is um, pretty much anything from um, so operations. So if you're finding Twitter a little tricky, um, if you've locked yourself out and you can't get back in, uh, just reach out to one of the three of us and we can help you get back in. Um, there will be an email address that's shared at the end of the presentation. So feel free to ping um, an email there and that goes to the three of us. Um, but we can also help you with any projects that you have coming up, um, any campaigns you have coming up. And if you have questions about Twitter products, how to use them best um, and just general Twitter advice. Um, so yeah, definitely don't hesitate to um, reach out to us with questions. Uh, today, I'm going to go through a few different Twitter products. Uh, some of those are quite accessible, meaning that after this session, you can just log into the app um, and use them um, straight after. Um, others do require Media Studio. So if you don't have Media Studio, um, just um, ping us and let us know and we can set you up. Um, and then there is a bit of an innovation piece at the end uh, that I also wanted to share. Um, and after all of that, I'm gonna quickly go through our monetization program. So this might not be for everybody on the call, but if anybody is interested in uh, monetizing their um, video content, um, I'll go through a few of those details. Uh, so on to the next slide. So uh, as probably most of you know, uh, Twitter have rolled out some conversational settings, um, which allow you to be in control of who can reply and comment on your tweets. So as we're tweeting out, there'll be a little icon and there'll be three different options. Uh, the first option will be everybody can reply, everyone can join in um, on your tweet. The second option will be only your followers uh, can reply to your tweet. And then the third option will be only the people of which you have tagged in your tweet copy can reply. And this also means that if you tag no one, then no one can reply or comment on your tweet. So in this example here, uh, routers have um, opened up a Q&A on Twitter and they have invited their audience to submit questions via a, a hashtag. So here they've also chose to uh, apply conversational settings on this tweet. And this could be for a couple of reasons. So the first reason being, um, this is about a sensitive topic, but also the reason could be is that this tweet has a pretty clear call to action. It has a date and a time of which the conversation will be happening. And it also um, allows you and shows you how to submit questions and participate. So by applying conversational settings, they're only reinforcing that more, uh, more and um, ensuring that the conversation doesn't happen already on this tweet um, before it's uh, June 17. So moving on to threads. So threads are a really great way for you to add context to your tweets over a period of time. So this is very often used when live tweeting an event. And what it means is that as a user, if someone comes across your tweet, whether it be your first tweet, your second tweet, your last tweet, they are able to see all of that given context. So this avoids people reading tweets and not being able to see how that story has developed over time. So really, really good when tweeting out um, live events. So in this particular example here, Indigenous X, Indigenous X are an independent uh, media outlet. And uh, here they are um, live tweeting and fact checking at a press conference. And then next to that, you have um, a journalist here live tweeting at a Senate hearing. Cool, so moments are a curation tool. Moments are a way in which you can build a story, not only with your own tweets, but with tweets all over Twitter. So the way you would create one of these is you would straight from your app, go in and um, create the moment, but you can search for tweets using hashtags, using accounts, 
You can use exact tweet copy if you're looking for an exact tweet. Um, and you can pull these all together um, and create a story. So here, uh, the AFL throughout the season this year, they have at the end of each game, uh, tweeted out the best goals of that game. Then at the end of the season, they've collected all of those tweets, thrown them into a moment and have tweeted that out to their audience. So it just makes it really easy for the fans to be able to see um, all of those highlights throughout the whole season. You can also take this one step further. Um, and if you did want to create something like this, for example, uh, the best of your work covered in tweets on 2020 in a moment, you could then pin this to your account, meaning that anyone who comes to your account, that moment would be the first thing that they'd see. In the second example we have coming here, uh, this is from SBS earlier on this year. So during Eurovision, SBS broadcasted a show called The Big Night In. So they allowed Australia to all vote for uh, the contestant that they thought should have won Eurovision. And then on the night, uh, they had a countdown, they had special guests, they had performers, and they also had a watch party on Twitter. So through the hashtag Big Night In, the community, the community could participate in conversation, um, you know, watch together. And everybody was tweeting in uh, their ISO get up um, as well as their big night in watch party. Uh, so photos, videos of costumes, of what they're eating and all that sort of thing. So what SBS then did was create a moment and bring all of these community tweets in together so that everyone could look through and see what everybody else was doing and how they were watching uh, the big night in. So really cool. Uh, conversational cards. So conversational cards are available to you through Media Studio, which again, really easy for us to set you up with. And in an absolute nutshell, um, they look really, really great on your Twitter and they add that button at the bottom. So if you want to engage with your audience and you want them to tweet something very specific back to you and out into Twitter, then you can use conversational cards to make it really easy for them to do so. So in this particular case, Bloomberg um, have set up a Q&A on Twitter and to tweet in your question, you have to tweet hashtag coronavirus answers. So by using the conversational card, Bloomberg have made it super easy for people to just click on that button that will auto, um, automate a tweet with that hashtag in it, tweet the question out um, and away it goes, rather than having to remember the hashtag, open up a tweet, type it out and then type your question. So um, it, is, it is a simple product, but it does um, increase engagement with your audience and, and look pretty good. Uh, and Q and A's. So I've already shown a couple of examples of Q and A's um, across Bloomberg and whatnot already. Um, but again, um, another way for you to engage with your audience um, and, and ask questions from them and get them to respond to you and vice versa. So um, if you would like to hear from your audience, answer their questions, or you have a guest in which you'd like to host a Q and A on Twitter, um, all you need to do is simply tweet out um, using a unique hashtag request the questions, and then at a later time, you can uh, go through those questions and answer them. Um, so the reason why I've mentioned a unique hashtag is that's quite important because if you don't have a unique hashtag to ask your questions, you're gonna be fishing through a whole bunch of content looking for the ones that are relevant for you. So we generally just recommend hashtag ask and then whomever is answering the questions. So the example here on the screen is Kara and her team work with Malala and her team back in 2018 um, to uh, invite her community and invite the Twitter community to submit questions of which she would answer at a later date. Um, so yeah, just a really, really great Q&A to be hosting on Twitter. And then in this second example, so Foxtel uh, earlier this year brought fans together with the artists that were performing at the Firefight Festival. So this particular Q&A uses a Twitter product called the VIT app. So to get the VIT app, we just send you a link, you click on the link and download it, super easy. Um, but what it does is it makes it a little bit easier if you're um, wanting to film 
video uh, footage of the answers and then tweet that back and connect it with the questions. So rather than having to find the question on Twitter and then film the clip and then upload it and reply, you can use the app to just film the answer and the app will automatically attach that to the question and tweet it out onto your account. So an example of that here with, with Foxtel. And then uh, lastly on the products, this is a bit more, um, there's a bit more production involved in this one, but it's called the retweet to remind. Um, you can also heart to remind um, on a tweet. And what this does is gives your audience the ability to opt in and receive a push notification on their phone um, to be reminded about something. So whether that might be a live stream or a broadcast um, or something that you're about to tweet, tweet about that's highly anticipated, um, you can um, allow people to, to be push notified um, about that event. So in this particular example, this isn't a live stream. But earlier on this year, the Australian Open um, were creating moments each day of the tournament that basically wrapped up the day, so the highlights of the day. So if you couldn't watch the tournament, you could just click on that moment and, and get the wrap up, right? So at the beginning of the tournament, they allowed their fans and their audience to heart or retweet this particular tweet, and then they would receive a push notification on their phone once that moment went out. And that's all I believe from um, the product standpoint, but now I'll just um, talk a little bit about monetization. Um, so really basically what this means is if you're uh, tweeting out um, professionally produced uh, video content, um, you're allowed to enter into our um, advertising uh, pre-roll program for which advertisers will just uh, run a pre-roll in front. So if this is something um, that interests you, really all you need to do um, is uh, ping myself or um, Ian or Ollie and we'll set you up with Media Studio and there'll be a little tab up the top that says monetization. You'll click in there. There'll be some TNCs to, um, to read through. And once you've done that, uh, there's a team at Twitter who will then look at your account and just make sure that um, you know, you have your profile photo, uh, you're tweeting out uh, clips uh, at least every three days um, and this sort of thing. Um, if you want more information on what the, that checklist is, we can also send that through. Um, and if that's all approved, um, all you have to do is upload your content into Media Studio. Uh, you then tag it. So um, the majority of you will be tagging your content as news. But if you were tasty, you might tag your content as food. And then you tweet it out. Uh, from an advertiser perspective, they create a campaign, they then select uh, which categories they want to align to, and then they upload their pre-roll and set that live. And then Twitter does the rest and, and aligns it. So this is um, a global program, meaning we have publishers all over the world, as well as advertisers all over the world, um, publishing content and um, running pre-rolls. Um, so what this means for you is if, if you have audiences elsewhere um, in the world, you are able to monetize your content there. Or if you're looking to expand your audience into other regions, um, this is also a good way to do so. Having said this, um, you are also able to geo-block your content. So if you really only want to stick within Australia, that's fine as well. Um, and if all of this sounds great and um, you're thinking you want to get involved, but then you're also thinking, uh, there's a couple of uh, advertisers I really wouldn't want to align to for whatever reason, whether it be sponsors, whether it be preference. Um, this is all within your control within the settings. Um, so you are able to deny list certain categories of advertisers and then Twitter will ensure that your content does not run against any advertiser within that category. And uh, this is the last slide on this, I promise. Uh, so if you're interested, a couple of best practices, um, the more content, the better. So the algorithm will always um, opt towards the uh, more relevant content um, from a user perspective. Um, share, share your content globally, um, if possible, um, expand your audience. And um, of course, really importantly, um, keep it brand safe. So we just ask that 
um, you're conscious about what you're, you're monetizing and putting into the program. Um, if uh, you see a clip and you think a brand probably wouldn't want to be promoting that, um, then just don't throw it in and, and that's really all we ask. Um, but that's it from me. I hope I've been able to sort of spark some ideas, um, but of course, um, throw questions into the comments section or again, there's an email address um, at the end. So um, just shoot me an email. Um, but otherwise, I'll hand it over to Pete to run you through TweetDeck. Thanks, Rose. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Pete Thompson, and I lead Twitter's curation team here in Australia. Uh, we're a team of curators based around the world, and our job is to find, share, and add context to the best of what's happening on Twitter. And today I'm gonna to introduce you all to TweetDeck, which is an incredible tool that my team use every day uh, to find and track stories and conversations. And it's an essential tool for journalists who wanna get the most out of Twitter. Uh, so I'll talk about what makes TweetDeck such a useful tool, uh, how it can help you all as journalists, and I'll touch on some of the most important features uh, that you need to know about. So we've already spoken a bit today about how important Twitter is for news. Uh, journalists use the platform to report from the source and from the scene. Uh, and users flock to the platform to follow along with those breaking news events uh, and trending conversations in, in real time. Uh, so there's a lot happening on Twitter with 1 billion tweets sent every couple of days. Uh, and sometimes that can be a bit overwhelming. Um, it can be difficult to work out what people are talking about, why they're talking about something, and then how you can get involved in the conversation. And that's where TweetDeck comes in. So TweetDeck is a toolkit that helps you make the most out of the platform because it allows you to cut through the noise and find the content that matters most to you. So it does this in three main ways. Firstly, it helps you monitor what's happening. Um, it then allows you to filter conversations to find the content that you need. And then it also helps you join in with that conversation, connect with users and grow your audience. And for journalists, uh, TweetDeck's features for monitoring, filtering, and showing content are extremely useful. So you'll be able to track multiple breaking news stories and trending topics in one place. Uh, you'll be able to monitor tweets from trusted and relevant sources. You can dig deep into the content and topics that are relevant to you. And you can also quickly and easily post your content and engage your audience uh, as an individual or as an entire team. So let's look at some of the key TweetDeck features that allow you to monitor what's happening. The first thing you'll notice about TweetDeck is that while Twitter only allows you to view tweets uh, in one timeline, TweetDeck's interface lets you, mul lets you open multiple columns uh, so you can track many conversations at once. Uh, and you can also customize it to suit your needs. So imagine you were using TweetDeck to cover the US elections uh, last Wednesday. Uh, here are some examples of columns that you could utilize in TweetDeck to help you keep across that breaking news uh, as it unfolds. So in the first column, you might wanna have your notifications open uh, so you can see who's getting in touch with you and you can keep a close eye on what's happening. Uh, in the second column, you can open up a search that tracks tweets um, that include a keyword or a hashtag that you're interested in. For example, hashtag US election. Uh, and that way you can see what people are saying about the election in real time. The third column could be a list of experts, um, expert sources and political journalists uh, that you've, uh, you've made yourself. <clears throat> so you can get live analysis, commentary and updates from accounts that you trust. Uh, the fourth column could be our trending column, which, keep, which um, lists the trending topics of the day and can help you keep up to date with what users are talking about. And then maybe the fifth column, you'd have tweets uh, showing from a certain user, uh, for example, Donald Trump, if you wanted to watch how he was responding to the results in real time. Uh, 
So I mentioned the trending column. Uh, this is one of the most useful uh, for monitoring what's happening on TweetDeck. When you add this column, you'll be able to see the top, uh, the latest top 20 trends. And you can filter them so they're personalized for your interests or filtered by location so you can see what people uh, in your area are talking about as it happens. Uh, lists are another essential part of monitoring conversations on TweetDeck. You can create your own lists of accounts from within TweetDeck or you can follow other people's lists. You can then open those lists as columns and keep track of the key accounts that are most important to you. You can also filter by keywords to see what those accounts are saying about a certain topic. Uh, so sometimes when you're monitoring a conversation, uh, you might want to dig a little deeper um, and TweetDeck allows you to create very specific content searches and filter these massive conversations down to just the tweets that you need to see. So the simplest way to do that is to open up a search in TweetDeck. Um, if you want to track a certain hashtag or keyword, you just type it into the search bar in the top left hand corner, uh, hit return, and it will automatically open a new column uh, that brings in every single tweet on the platform that includes that keyword. So for example, if you're following the US election, you might want to track uh, the US election hashtag, um, but that would bring in a lot of tweets. Uh, so you can also fine tune your search by combining keywords and using simple Boolean searches. Um, so if you were tracking the US election hashtag uh, and wanted to ensure you only saw tweets that also mentioned Joe, uh, Joe Biden or Donald Trump, you could add those terms to that search query. Um, now, even on election, on election day, even adding those keywords might bring in a lot of tweets. So TweetDeck has a ton of built-in filters uh, that you can utilize to trim the stream of tweets to only those that are most useful to you. Uh, so as well as including keywords, you can also exclude certain terms from appearing in the tweets. You can set a time range, which is really useful if you're looking for tweets from a previous event. You can choose a language or set a location. So you can see what people in Sydney specifically uh, are saying about the US election. You can choose to see only tweets from certain users. Um, you could select only verified users uh, or users from a certain list. And you can also filter tweets by engagement. So you only see those with a minimum number of likes, retweets or replies. And that's particularly useful if you're trying to find the tweets that are getting the most engagement uh, or creating the most conversation. So now that you've found your story or you've got to the bottom of a very obscure hashtag, it's time to get involved in the conversation. And you can do that directly uh, through TweetDeck. You can create and send tweets directly from TweetDeck. Um, you can post them from any of your accounts. You can include images, videos, and GIFs. Uh, you can also turn on a confirmation step uh, for your most important accounts. Um, this means you'll be prompted uh, to confirm you want to send a tweet from a certain account. And this is really handy when you're using both personal and work accounts in TweetDeck um, to avoid any unfortunate accidents. Uh, you can also schedule tweets in advance in TweetDeck uh, just by selecting the time and date that you want it to go out and then hit tweet. Uh, this is a great way to plan ahead and ensure you're always reaching your audience at the right times, even if you're not at the desk yourself. And you can also use multiple accounts um, in TweetDeck, so you and your team uh, can have access uh, to one or, or many accounts that you need to use. Um, you can set admins to manage access to those accounts um, and have uh, your whole team acting as contributors on, uh, on certain accounts, making it really easy to, to collaborate as a team on TweetDeck. Um, before I wrap up, I wanted to share a couple of extra pro tips. Um, Pop-up or sound alerts. Um, the, this is a great feature uh, for making sure you don't miss something important. So you can turn on notifications um, that sends you an instant alert on desktop when a tweet matching one of your filters or from one of your lists um, pops up in TweetDeck. 
so really useful if you're working on something else, uh, but you have um, key searches in your tweet deck and you don't want to miss um, an update on an important story. Uh, many of you will be familiar with uh, reverse image searches, uh, which is an essential tool for verifying um, content that you see online. You can actually perform a reverse image search uh, in TweetDeck with just one click. Uh, you just need to click on the magnifying glass in the top right hand corner of any image uh, that appears in your columns, making it really easy to uh, verify what you're seeing on the platform. Um, and there's also, there's, there's almost sort of no end to how specific you can get with your searches on TweetDeck. Um, advanced search allows you to create really detailed search queries that you can, you can save and share with your team. Um, so I mentioned earlier, you could combine keywords um, and this is sort of a more advanced example um, where the, on the slide you can see it lists fire near Sydney filtered by images and a minimum retweets of 10. That's combining a bunch of search, search, search terms um, to help you find tweets about fire happening in Sydney, containing images and uh, with a minimum number of, of retweets. Um, this is just one example to find out more about search terms. You can just um, go to the settings tab on TweetDeck, uh, click on search tips, and you'll see a whole bunch of ways you can combine searches uh, to get um, the most effective filter for you. Um, and that's almost it for me. The final thing to say about TweetDeck is that you really get the most out of it if you practice, test, and experiment with different columns um, and search queries to find out what works best for you. So I encourage all of you to dive in and give it a go. It's free for all Twitter users. All you have to do is visit uh, tweetdeck.twitter.com and log in using your Twitter account. Um, we'll also send out uh, a couple of links after this uh, with some resources um, to help you get started. So thanks for listening. Uh, I hope this has been useful and you can see some ways that TweetDeck can help you and your teams um, track and report uh, breaking news. That's it from me. Uh, I'll pass back over now to Kara. Thanks, Pete. Uh, appreciate it. And um, yes, I can definitely give um, very enthusiastic support for TweetDeck, use it all the time. And um, if you haven't gotten uh, used to it yet, I would highly recommend it. It's how I usually stay on top of everything going on in the news and politics space, um, which is what my job is mostly based on. And as you can all imagine, it has been very busy lately. Um, so to kick off our uh, policy and safety update point of view, I wanted to just quickly kind of um, set the table a little bit with you all and really reinforce um, Twitter's commitment to healthy conversations and serving the overall public conversation as a company. Um, this has been one of our top company priorities um, from our CEO and co-founder, Jack Dorsey down. And this has been something that um, Jack has really been uh, pushing to the forefront of the way that we look at um, our platform and prioritize the way that we are looking at policy and product updates moving forward. Uh, one of the key things that I think is also very important to um, point out is that we have really looked at developing Twitter as a platform uh, alongside the people that use it. So everything from the hashtag to the at symbol when you mention somebody to tweet storms, that all came about from users on the platform and the way that they um, just saw the platform um, being uh, most helpful for them and, and what they were um, you know, using it for, which was to connect with people and have a conversation. But one of the key things too is that we saw major constituencies of journalists and activists really influence how we approach this work. And um, we have a number of challenges, of course, that we'll continue to face um, both more broadly um, in terms of looking at over, uh, the open internet and structures um, in place um, from a regulatory standpoint, but also how we're really approaching the work of connecting people and um, moving towards a, a global um, framework for public conversation. 
So I wanted to just um, put one of Jack's tweets up here um, to show that we're really focused on trying to make sure that we help people feel safe, um, that we're surfacing really quality, incredible information in tackling these issues, and that we're also um, trying to continually update the way that we look at um, how this plays out on the platform from you know, disinformation and hateful conduct to most recently elections. And we're moving with a sense of urgency and purpose and commitment on all of these fronts. So as we continue to look at um, updating these policies, we're going to always be looking at how we can address emerging behaviors online. And it's reflective in the fact that the Twitter rules are a living document and we're always looking to expand um, the way that we uh, put them in, into place, but also our enforcement options. So as we go to the next slide, um, I'll go through a little bit more in detail about these policies. Um, I'm sure everyone um, has been, if you, if you were following elections, both in the US, but also, um, you know, we most recently over on the side of, of the world had the New Zealand elections um, in October. And um, I'm sure that you're all very across uh, some of these updates that we've been making around policies, especially in regards to civic integrity. Uh, this is probably the most top of mind as we've been rolling this out in real time. And it looks at not only protecting the integrity of um, the actual elections themselves, but also any major referendums or censuses or ballot initiatives um, that come up, which, for example, was very important in New Zealand, which had two referendum um, that were also on the ballot in addition to the overall general election. So we've done everything from update our policies around misleading information about how people can participate in the election to um, barring any sort of um, tweets or information that's being shared for the purpose of suppression and intimidation. And what most of um, what you've seen probably in the last week was also around um, our policy trying to block any misleading information about outcomes. So um, we either label those tweets um, or we apply public interest interstitials, which is something that has been in place for world leaders since 2018. Um, but these are all, um, you know, basically uh, different product features that we've rolled out that are trying to really look at um, stemming the tide of any sort of false or misleading information. And again, trying to encourage people to participate in these civic processes, um, which are um, integral to our democracies in the way that governments work around the world. So um, one of the key things too um, that we've most recently done and we've been working on here in Australia um, is updating policies um, around dehumanization. Uh, we've been undergoing a public consultation with a number of key partners and trust and safety council members around how we can update this policy to better capture um, behaviors that we're seeing that are attempting to dehumanize based on um, ethnicity or national origin. And uh, a lot of our organizations um, and partners here in Australia have been key to helping inform um, how this policy will look and, and how it will be shaped um, in the coming months when we look to release it publicly and put it into place. Another key thing that, of course, we've been doing is um, this year has been all about COVID, has been really updating the way that we're keeping the tweets flowing around um, COVID-19. And again, trying to make sure that we're surfacing up um, credible information in these critical times. Um, I know that we've seen more people turn to Twitter to participate in these conversations over the past year around um, healthcare and, and being safe um, in the midst of the pandemic. And so we've been trying to make sure that we're optimizing the way that um, the service is sending up that information and that um, we're also trying to make sure that um, we have strong policies around the COVID-19 misinformation piece so that um, whenever there is kind of um, anything that would be antithetical to what um, we have uh, either international organizations like the WHO saying or in local contexts like the Department of Health here in Australia, um, we want to make sure that um, information that could uh, translate to offline harm is um, being either removed from the service or being couched with um, different labels and search prompts so that people are able to be directed to um, the information that they need to stay safe. 
Um, the other key thing too, is that we've really been um, getting a lot more effective at the way that we're enforcing all of these policies. So it, um, that's one of the key things we know is you can have wonderful policies, but if you can't enforce them, um, then you're not doing the whole job. So one of the key things that we've been doing is um, really making sure that we're not only using proprietary internal tools to enforce, but also um, working very closely with our user operations teams to be able to review this content um, quickly and thoroughly. So um, in the past uh, reporting period, we actually have taken action on over 2.4 million accounts. And we've seen a 54% increase um, for content that's been removed under our hateful conduct policy, for instance, as we continue to iterate on that policy and make it um, much more robust. We also, of course, um, are working towards transparency so that you can understand these actions and how they're working. Um, so we do have a biannual transparency report. We've had it available since 2012. We we're one of the first companies to do it. And we actually just revamped our transparency report to be a whole center. So you can go and see everything from information that's being requested to be taken down by governments to how we're um, actually affecting um, and being able to take down information under Twitter rules and our terms of service. Um, also within the Transparency Center, we make available our state-backed info operation data sets. So we are um, one of the only companies in the industry that whenever we did um, actually find any sort of data sets uh, about state-backed info operations, we disrupt it, we take it down, and then we put it in a database so that we can encourage academics and partners alike to research this, to produce their own findings. And actually it helps inform us as well as we see these behaviors continue to evolve and change. So that's all available at um, our Transparency Center, transparency.twitter.com. I'd encourage you to look at it. Also some very fun graphics. Um, if you like uh, looking at a bunch of data illustrations, which as a fellow nerd, I do very much enjoy. And if we go to the next slide, um, I'll quickly take you through just a few little um, kind of tips we have around safety and security checklists. Um, a lot of you guys will have already been very familiar with this, but as we continue to see more and more people flock to the platform, and especially as journalists, um, you have a very prominent position being front and center at a lot of these issues as they break. We want to make sure that you're staying safe and that you have the tools in place to make sure that you're able to participate in the conversation um, in a secure way. So one of the key things that we're encouraging and we're actually making this um, more and more um, uh, mandatory for especially um, world leaders is um, two-factor authentication. If you don't have it turned on, it's super easy. There's um, all of the steps at our help center, so help.twitter.com. Um, but you can either turn it on with a secondary login method, so it can be um, a login code, um, it could be a physical security key if you're into like Yubi keys, um, or it can be um, an authenticator app. So like Google authentication app. Um, that's something that I use for a lot of my different two-factor authentication services. Easy to download from the app store, has a unique code each time, keeps you very secure. We also have the password reset protection piece. And so um, this is something that you can just check in your security settings and you'll be prompted to enter in either your email address or your phone number um, that's associated with your account. And then you get a confirmation code. Um, so that's another way to, again, really lock down the account and make sure that you're the only one that's um, accessing it um, if needed. And as Pete said earlier with TweetDeck, if you have a team that's using um, an organizational account, TweetDeck Teams uh, makes it really easy for you to share access to a Twitter account. Um, but for your personal account or for high profile accounts, you really want to make sure that you're um, limiting the number of people that are logged in. So these are ways to make sure that you have that um, very uh, tight, secure protection. The other piece, of course, is also if you ever want to archive your Twitter data, um, you have full control of your Twitter history. You can download it starting from your very first tweet. Um, and if your Twitter account's also connected to Periscope, you'll have the option to request data from Periscope too. So that's something um, if you ever want to see um, all the data that you have um, and it's been um, associated with your Twitter account, you can download it. And that's a way to also keep all of that secure. If you do ever uh, travel to places, um, for instance, we have activists that do this where they travel to areas where they might need to shut down their Twitter account for a while. 
um, but they're still able to archive that and, and keep all of that um, for future reference. Um, of course, uh, TweetDeck Teams, I just um, covered that and also Pete covered it, but I highly recommend it when I worked in politics. Um, it definitely helped me out a number of times. The other option too that I always just want to draw people's attention to and that we've seen um, utilized in certain instances again, um, maybe in an area where there's been a big story that's just hit you're traveling, um, when we travel again, um, you might be traveling or covering um, areas of the world that might be a little bit more at risk. Um, you can put your tweets into um, a protected status. So by default, tweets are public, but if you wanna protect your tweets in your settings, um, it means that only the people that follow you would be able to see your Twitter account and um, new people wouldn't be able to see your Twitter account. They'd have to request it. You'd have to approve them. Um, so this is also something I've seen with people who might be wanting to share um, information more about their, their families or children or, um, you know, something that might be a little bit more private, but still wanting to be on the platform. This is another option that um, provides a little bit more um, control over your own experience. With location sharing too, uh, Twitter lets you select if you want to do that on an individual tweet basis. So um, whenever you go to tweet, um, you can post your location setting or you can not. Um, so usually we always say if it's a home or office address or a school address or something, we usually recommend not to turn on your location settings. Um, but again, it, it's an option that you have on a tweet by tweet basis. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. The other thing we also talk about is discoverability. And so if you do want to connect with people on Twitter that you already know, you have the option to share your email or um, phone number with Twitter to make you more discoverable and it'll go through your contacts and, and see if you want to connect up with um, folks that way. Um, and then of course, we always say, um, as somebody who is also um, a solicitor, uh, copyright and trademark are um, no laughing matters. They're very, very serious. And so we always encourage people not to share content or videos or images um, that have not been credited or have not been consented to uh, be shared by the actual source or the person that created that, um, that work. Uh, plagiarism is very serious and it can have severe implications on the platform. So that's the um, kind of, quick uh, tips and tricks um, for your kind of safety. And um, I also just wanted to quickly let you know, we have a lot of different filtering options. Um, and I'd encourage you to go through this um, quality filter options in the settings, in your privacy and security settings um, under your account. It basically is just a simple way um, to kind of let you curate your experience and control what you see on the platform. And so these are options to mute notifications from people. There's even more advanced filters um, that will let you um, mute uh, different accounts or mute keywords um, and hashtags. So if you go through all of the um, options, um, you can or if you think that you're missing something and you don't know why, it might be because you have some of these settings on. So I'd highly recommend for you to just um, check out your notification um, filtering options under security and settings, and that can really help change your experience. And um, then we're gonna hand it over to Larry. Um, Larry is our APAC head of comms and we'll be able to talk with you a little bit about how to work with our comms team. Hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon uh, from uh, from Singapore. I, uh, I'm Larry. I'm the uh, head of comms for APAC, uh, and I'm just uh, standing in for 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 those who have worked previously with uh, Stuart Russell. Uh, he's he's out today, uh, so I'm taking on his 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 role today. And uh, thanks, Cara, for 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 really taking us through you know what some of the policies and so on so on about the. The tips and tricks are, but uh, I want to take a few minutes to kind of give you a little bit of an overview of what we, we do at Twitter comms uh, in terms of working with with you as, as, uh, as members of the media. And I think that there's really four, four key things that, that we 
we try to, to, to best be your best partner for, for some of the stories and some of the features that you might be working on, uh, primarily around you know, pulling data. If you're looking for, for uh, specific uh, information about uh, a, a story they're looking at, uh, like which is the, mo which is the most uh, popular hashtags during this period of time, Christmas is coming up, so what are you looking at in terms of shopping and so on? These are the kind of things that we help you with, uh, identifying the right spokespeople, uh, we, we recognize that there's a lot of people uh, that you can potentially reach out to in Twitter uh, and, you know, finding out which is exactly the right uh, spokesperson to speak to, whether you're working on a sports story or a policy uh, for, or looking for a quote for, from policy, um, we can help identify and connect you with the right people and making sure that you have the right content uh, that you can work with. Uh, the other is, is, is really keeping in touch with us uh, and getting us to, to, to uh, update you on what are some of the, the um, content that, uh, that, that is always on our platform. So we, we can always keep you updated on what are some of the trends, uh, who are some of the people who are, who are really making waves in uh, your market or some of the other markets that you're looking at and so on. And the last is really keeping you updated on what are some of the business as well as policy updates that we have uh, in, in, in across Twitter. Uh, it, it's a fast growing mar market. It's a fast growing, you know, our, our platform is always uh, updating our policies as well. And uh, this is something that we, we do like to keep our media partners updated as well. And uh, just to share with you some of the examples of how we've worked in the past. Uh, these are some of the stories that, that we've, we've done before, uh, you know, working around, you know, big, uh, big uh, media cat stories like uh, Game of Thrones, you know, how it became the most tweeted uh, episode in, in TV history for Australia, you know, uh, around uh, what we call VITs or very important tweets, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is like Ariana Grande and, you know, other entertainment or movie stars that you're looking at, as well as, you know, across, uh, uh, election stories uh, across politics and so on, which are the which are some of the quirkier stories that we have, and you know, and um, more, most uh, more along the lines of like uh, when you're following uh, hard hitting uh, uh, events such as you know the, the school strikes, and where you know the, the the tweets are coming from, which are the which which uh, hashtags are trending, and what are people talking about? We can help uh, contact us to help you get a sense of you know, where those things are happening. Uh, I realize I've gone a little bit fast because I'm conscious of time, but, uh, you know, really, I think that this is how, uh, you know, you can best utilize us to uh, help you write your stories and craft some of the ideas that you might have. Uh, if not, I will hand it over back to uh, the next session for any Q and A's that you might have. Thanks, Larry. Thanks. Um, so we have a few minutes and don't worry if you still have questions after this, um, you can always DM us or we also have a partner email address. Yes, there it is. Um, and you can always send through any of the questions through email. I know that we had um, a few quick questions that were coming up. Um, and I think these are for Rose. So Rose, we had a question about um, what are the tips for promoting a Q&A and what's the right cadence of video to text tweets? Uh, yeah, certainly. Okay, so if you want to promote your Q&A, what we would recommend is tweeting out to let everybody know what the hashtag is uh, at least seven days in advance. Uh, I guess the earlier you can do that, the better. Um, but seven days is a really good time to make sure that all of your audience have seen that um, and they can bookmark it. Um, and then ensure that you've got the hashtag in there as well. So you've created that well in advance. Um, keep it really clear. So when you um, are communicating the date and the time, um, don't overcrowd it with hashtags and handles. Just be really super clear. Give the time zone so people know exactly when should they be um, joining from different parts of Australia. Um, and keep reminding your audience. So every day, another tweet, the Q&As, um, you know, in five days, in four days, um, and you can pin a tweet um, onto your account. So just keep reminding people that that's happening um, so that even on the day, um, should they have forgotten, they know to, to um, tune into that Q&A. 
Um, in terms of cadence for, for tweets and video tweets, so for video tweets, um, well, we, we love video on Twitter. That's definitely our preferred medium, and that's what our users are telling us as well. Year on year, increased um, minutes watched on all of our video content. Um, so we definitely um, recommend that if you can get some, some video content out on your account, then please do so. Um, and then I guess just keep it relevant. So in terms of how much, I mean, there is no really one answer to that. Um, if, you've got, if you've got more content than you possibly could need and you need to select, I mean, you're in a really good position. Um, but if you don't, then really just um, ensure that that content is um, really short um, and easy to consume. So we would never really recommend anything over like three or four minutes, um, especially nothing at the 10 minute range. I'm not even sure you can really tweet that unless you get um, special permissions. Um, so yeah, just really short, easy to consume um, content. And then the tweet copy, make it clear what people are choosing to watch. So often people will tweet out um, content but not actually indicate in the tweet copy what that is. And so you're less likely to get your audience to, to stop in their timeline um, and, and consume. So um, yeah, I think just keep it clear, um, keep it consistent um, and daily if you can and should be sweet.